Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to the seminar on cubicle sets. Uh, we're finishing week two, and today we have as our first speaker, uh, Brandon Shapiro, who will speak about cubicle n categories and uh, cubicle theta. Brandon, the stage in the moment are all yours. Thank you, Chris. Uh, everybody can see all right. Um, I think last time it worked fine where you could see my mouse, which is helpful. Of course. So, yep. I'll mention in advance, there might be a few technical difficulties that I messed up when making this, but I think I worked out most of them. So first of all, the title of this talk, cubicle line categories and cubicle theta. So I'm gonna start out by telling you what one of those is. Uh, namely cubicle n categories. Now, in the paper that this talk is based off of, um, which I'll cite in a minute, um, n is omega, but by observation, you can see that the result works just as well for finite n as well. So what is a cubicle omega category? Uh, so first of all, we're gonna be talking about strict cubicle n categories. So it is an N truncated cubicle set of any kind equipped with K different composition operations on the K cubes. So when by N truncated cubicle set, I just mean we only have sets of cubes up to dimension N. We don't worry about anything higher than that. And when I say any sort with degeneracies, I mean, we can have connections, we could have diagonal symmetries and such, though for most of the talk, we're gonna focus on only when we only have degeneracies and connections. So what do I mean by composition operations? Whoops, Let's see, technical difficulty number one. Uh, all right, so in dimension one, it just looks like composition of arrows in a category. So if N is greater than or equal to one, we're gonna have a composition operation on the one cubes, which looks just like composition in category. And formally, this is gonna look like a map, which I'll call a uh, circ one, um, which goes from the limit of these components of X uh, into X. And another way of phrasing that is that any diagram of two composable arrows in X gets mapped to a single arrow in X, just like this. Uh, and this is meant to be analogous with how things work in categories. Okay. So things get more interesting in higher dimensions. When K equals two, well, at first we have a composition that looks kind of similar. Stick two cubes next next to each other, two, two cubes, rather, and we should be able to compose them horizontally. We might also want to compose them vertically, like this. And so these are the two different composition operations on two cubes. And you see that it's compatible on the boundary with composition of one cells, just like we're used to in classical two categories. And we get the same sort of picture. These compositions can be phrased as either a limit of components in X into, uh, that should say X2. Sorry about that. This should be two. And likewise, maps from the set of diagrams of either this form or this form in X going to the set of, again, I forgot to change that one. That should be squares in X. Hopefully that's clear. Sorry for the last minute edits. And so this is, seems like a fairly natural generalization of, um, or rather analog of two categories where instead of these vertical cells being scrunched down to points, we can compose in two different directions, which both look like this. And 
we also have so for them. We also could go on for three, four, five, et cetera. In each case, you have one composition operation for each direction. Um, so n for n dimensional cubes. But all of my pictures in this talk are going to focus on the case of two. So we have some extra conditions. Um, for instance, we want these composition operators to be associative in the following sense. So let's say, let's use the horizontal direction to compose. So that could represent any of the dimensions, um, which is what I've written this I for. If you have three cubes next to each other, you compose the first two to get something like this and then compose that with the third, that gives the same thing as doing it in the other order. Again, perfectly analogous with n categories, except now it's done with cubes. Then we also want identities. And we want them to come from the traditional degeneracies. So epsilon i tends an n minus one cube to an n cube. Um, uh, Brendan, uh, sorry, there's a, there's a uh, there's a question about uh, which paper uh, you're following here. And so your key ah. answer is that it's Al Argel Brown Steiner, but uh, I'll, let, I'll let you answer. <laughs> yeah, so that's correct. Um, and I write the name of that paper down in just a minute. That should be somewhere around here. Sorry, I should have mentioned it at the beginning. But yes, oh, right. this definition Thanks. is from Al Agel, Brown, and Steiner, as is the theorem that I will be sort of proving. Well, I will be proving it. Thank you. It will be somewhat different from theirs. Anywho, um, we want to have identities, just like in traditional n categories, where the cube that is degenerate in the ith direction, like this one here, is an identity for composition in the ith direction. So we get something like this, composing with the degenerate cube in the correct direction, just gives you what you start with. And the last thing we have, which is the sort of defining property when we add in higher dimensions, is we want them to interact nicely by the interchange law. So this can be any two directions where you can think of these cubes as extending in some directions backwards, not drawn but I will only care about dimension two. If you have a grid like this, you can either compose them in the I direction or the J direction first, and then the other one. And you ought to get the same thing. Um, this ABCD notation, I'm not gonna use going forward, but it seemed easier than writing out iterated composites. So these are cubical N categories. If you believe in regular N categories, so to speak, um, these should feel like a fairly natural thing to work with. But what I'm going to talk about today is what I consider a pretty surprising results. Oh, oops. One more condition. Um, when we have extra structures like connections, that tends to involve extra equations with the, com with the composition operations. So in this case, if you compose the two connections in either of these two ways, um, you get a square which certainly looks like this one on the boundary, but you have to impose as an axiom that it actually agrees with the expected degeneracy. And I don't think this is going to come up again in the talk, though, if you're looking for a more detailed proof of some of what I'll say, it is quite relevant. So, what am I going to prove? So the paper by Al Agel, Brown, and Steiner that this is based off of sets about proving this, that cubical n categories with connections, that is both connections, is equivalent to globular n categories. And again, in the paper, they only do it for omega, but the argument works just as well. And that paper is called multiple categories, the equivalence of a globular and a cubical approach. So I would like to prove this theorem for you, or at least convince you of it. But if you've read that paper, it has a lot of equations. 
it goes through all of the combinatorics of these things with the epsilons and the gammas and the circs compositions and proves lots and lots of equations for them. And then with, with, with some pictures. Um, and, uh, sorry, we have a question yes. in the chat. Uh, are we requiring that all but one direction in the n categories are trivial in each dimension, but is it implied by the connection law? No, we are not assuming that. So these are not meant to look like globular n categories, um, which is what makes this result more surprising, I think. So oftentimes in when working with globular n categories, you may model them um, in a way that starts out with something more cubical, like multi-simplicial sets, and then imposes some globularity conditions that, well, they're actually degenerate in all but one dimension, so we get something that looks like where the cubes actually end up looking like this, because these edges are degenerate. We are not assuming that here we'll be able to prove that these are equivalent to those without imposing that assumption. Though so things that look like this will come up. Oh, so do you mind if I follow up really quickly? Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I was just wondering um, what, what distinguishes this from n-fold categories then? Like, is it the connection law, I guess, somehow? So what distinguishes this from n-fold categories, which so I assume you mean double categories, triple categories, and the like. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Is that in that case, you actually have different classes of morphisms. So the arrows, horizontal and vertical arrows, come from different sets. Um, they're, in a sense, distinct kinds of things. In the cubical case, all of those are the same. All squares are the same, all cubes are the same, regardless of which directions they go in. Um, so for instance, that's why we're allowed to have these degeneracies where you can have an arrow going down and an arrow going horizontally, which in double categories would not be something you could generally define. That's great, thanks. Yeah, and that, that, that is an important distinction. Um, so I would say the reason I wanted to give this talk is because I looked at this paper and thought the result was really cool, but had a hard time parsing through all of the equations. So my hope is that this talk can be something of a movie version for the proof of this result, where I'm gonna add in some more modern machinery and a lot of pictures to hopefully shed some light on some conceptual reasons why this is true. So, first step, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about globular n categories and, in particular, what this theta machinery looks like more classically that I'm going to generalize to cubes. So, first of all, theta n is, I'm just going to define theta n, though there are classically many different definitions of it as the full subcategory of strict n categories whose objects are the free n categories on globular pasting diagrams. And what do I mean by that? Well, in dimension one, globular pasting diagrams just look like strings of arrows. These are things that in a one category we can compose into a morphism. And you'll notice that, so, in particular, these are all one categories, the ordinals, and this category of those ordinals is precisely the simplex category. So theta one is just delta, and we're generalizing up from there. Then when we move into dimension two, well, first of all, we have all of these one-dimensional pacing diagrams. Those are also included in theta two. So there's a copy of the simplex category. But now we also have the two cell and composites of the two cell, but now in both directions. Now in both directions. And in particular, 
if we're looking at the maps from the two cell into this composite object, we have both of the inclusions into the first and second two cell we're composing, and also the third one into the composite of these two, which is meant to be analogous to the composite face map from the one simplex to the two simplex. And we have this kind of composite operation in both of these and even more generally for any pasting diagram of two cells such as this, we have a co-composition face map, but I'll call it, which I'll write as circ sub p bar, uh, where p is the pasting diagram. So we can think of this as a map from the two cell into this pasting diagram that consumes all of it in a sense. It goes to the largest composition morphism in the free two category on these. Now, like I said, I'll mostly be focusing on things in two dimensions today, but, oh no, okay, there's the technical difficulty. Um, this could extend to all N as well. Now, these composition operations look like this, where for every pasting diagram in A, we can compose them to get a two cell in A, um, where here I wrote the two cell with an N to mean the N cell. Um, that's a little bit clunky, but we don't need that notation for very long. So for each N pasting diagram, we get, oh yeah, so just the way we define this map is we're thinking of if we have a map from P into some N category A, we can compose that up into a single morphism by pre-composing that map with this co-composition operation. And this is similar to how in a category you have a map from the two simplex into your category and you can think of composition as pre-composing with the co-composition map from the one simplex. And so if we extend our N category, instead of just having N cells for each N and algebraic structure of composition operations, we can extend that to a functor from all of theta N into sets called the nerve where we send, where we send P, each of these pacing diagrams to the set of diagrams that look like that in A, um, which in particular is maps from the free N category on P into A. And this defines a nerve and is completely analogous to the nerve of one categories. So also like the nerve of one categories, this is fully faithful and we can characterize which theta N sets are nerves um, because if we have, if all of the pacing diagrams can be composed into an N cell like this, then, sorry about that. Well, first of all, we know that the, so if B is a functor from data N to sets, so it has a set for all of these different pastings. Well, what we want to be the case is that for any, we want it to be the case, for instance, that for any um, object in B, in, in the component of B indexed by three arrows, which includes the composite of those arrows, as we saw up here, we want any three composable arrows to extend to an element of B triple arrow here. So another way of phrasing that is that the maps from this representable, um, the representable three simplex in theta n sets into B agrees with the map from just three arrows into B. Any three arrows extend to all of these composites. And this is just like describing the nerves of categories in simplicial sets. 
Another way of describing this property is that B has a lifting property against these three. So this is basically the same as what I said before. This, we call these spine inclusions of the three arrows into the three simplex, and that any three arrows in B extend uniquely to this three simplex, which specifies how to compose them. So this is an alternative definition of N categories, and because this nerve is fully faithful, we can treat NCAT as a full subcategory of theta N sets. And to give a sense of how this works in higher dimensions, again, sorry for the glitches. Um, oh, yeah, so this is just another phrasing of this property here. And in simplicial sets, we call that the Siegel condition, where simplicial sets satisfying the Siegel condition are nerves of categories. And then in higher dimensions, we get the same kind of picture where the component of B indexed by this composition of two cells is going to be a limit of the components on single two cells. And that corresponds to maps from the representable. Um, you can think of this as a two simplex of two cells, agrees with just having those two cells arranged in that fashion. And so again, we can think of that as a lifting problem where for any two cells arranged like that in B, we can extend them to have a composite. And the one with the composite is representable in theta n sets. And so we're going to call B Siegel if it satisfies these properties, just like we call nerves of categories Siegel in simplicial sets. So what this tells us is that we can define n categories as functors from this category theta n uh, to set, which satisfy the Siegel condition. And this is going to be helpful in proving the equivalence between n categories and cubical n categories. Now, this isn't going to come up again in the talk, but I thought it might be useful to mention that an idea that I used when sort of working out this translation of the paper is that of a limit sketch. Um, in this case, the Siegel condition is equivalent to restricting among functors from theta n op into set those that preserve certain limits. Um, so this pasting diagram in theta n is actually a limit of these, or rather in theta n op. So it's a co-limit in theta n. And so B is an N category if it preserves that limit. But for the sake of time, I won't go into any more detail on that. So, and then you might call models of the sketch um, the N categories, which preserve those limits. So all of this can be phrased in terms of sketches. So I won't use that terminology going forward. So, ah, yes. One other technical glitch. Um, so I'll pause for a second for questions before I switch to a second page of notes. All right, well, feel free to interrupt at any point. One note's been giving me all kinds of trouble, so I think it likes me better when I don't have as long pages. All right, so what we're going to do now is try to repeat that picture, but for cubical n categories. And it seemed fitting to call the categories we construct theta n, but where the theta is now cubical. So this is what we're trying to do. Find a category, cube, theta cube n, which describes cubical n categories the same way that theta n describes globular n categories. And Wait, what's latex for this theta? Um, good question. I haven't figured that out yet, <laughs> but I will report back. Um, this notation <laughs> came after I started writing the notes, um, but I like it so much that 
I'll have to find a way. I think the Chinese character for sun would be appropriate. Ooh. Okay, great. Yeah, logic never fails to have what I need. That's not true at all. I forget I said that. Um, but yeah, that's very exciting to hear. So we're going to want to define this similarly as a full subcategory of cubicle n categories, namely the ones that are free on cubicle pasting diagrams. And as we'll see, deciding what cubicle pasting diagrams should be is really the name of the game. So the first choice you might come up with, which is a pretty good one, is just grids of cubes. So in one dimension, it's again strings. It looks like delta. In dimension two, it's these grids of squares, kind of like the pacing diagrams in theta two, except now the height and the width have to be the same because they're cubes and they don't scrunch down on these vertical maps like the globular case. And so this works pretty well. What we're adding to the cube category is compositions. And this has the same kind of co-composition maps as we saw in theta, where we have a map from the representable square, or rather the free cubicle n category on the square, into this cubicle n category that just sends the square to the big one, gotten by composing these two smaller ones. And I tried to use the color scheme to make sense. So usually blue in these cubicle n categories will be things we are composing, and orange will be the composite. But if something is unclear, let me know, because the pictures for this can be a little bit ambiguous. And then again, for bigger grids, we get these co-composition maps that send this square to the composite square when we allow composites of those six squares in both directions. And again, you can define a nerve in this way that just maps any cubical n category to the cubical theta n set where the component at this pasting diagram is n functors from this cubicle n category into the one we're considering, uh, which I'll call x. And just as before, this is fully faithful. Um, all of the composition structure that we get is captured by this cubicle theta n. And we can again identify cubicle n categories as a full subcategory of pre-sheets over this cubicle theta n. Um, where those are characterized by a lifting property, just as before. A unique lifting property, because this is the strict case. Right, so this is where I gave up on the little boxes. So I'll have to resort to clicking and dragging. Um, now this cubicle theta category is pretty good. Like these are the properties that we want. We want a nerve functor, we want it to be fully faithful, and we want some kind of sequel condition. But in order to prove the equivalence with the globular case, we want to do a little bit extra that we get from having the connections. So I'm going to define for you two more categories. So what, there are a number of different ways to characterize what the pacing diagram should be. My favorite actually involves um, a construction similar to my first talk last Wednesday where you define a familial monad on semi-cubical sets whose algebras are cubical n categories. But for the sake of time, I'll say that what you get from that is that the pacing diagram should really just be anything that composes into a single n cube. So if we don't have connections, these would seem to be all there is. The compositions are all composing something in this direction, something in this direction, and the degeneracies just give you the zero length grids. So that should be everything. And connections at first glance wouldn't seem to change that. When you apply the connection to a square, it goes down to an edge. But when we add in composites, we get some weird stuff. So one of the things we get is from, oops, 
So if you have three you squares. Give me a question, sorry. Uh, I think this one, were you asking a question? No. Hmm, we can't hear you. Uh, or at least I can't hear you. No, I can't either. Okay. Maybe I'll mute as well and we'll continue, but hopefully the technical difficulties will be resolved soon. Yeah, I have up at any point. So in the meantime, we have this map from, if you have three squares next to each other like this, where if you ignore the orange lines in here, this is a perfectly good pasting diagram from above. The degeneracies give us a map to the square that take this middle cube just goes to itself and we fold up the edges. So you can think of folding this bottom morphism up by the um, min degeneracy and folding this top morphism here down using the max degeneracy. And I'll draw another picture in a second that shows what that looks like. But first, we also want to pre-compose this with a map from the square, the free cubicle n category on a square, into this grid just by the co-composition. So you get, by composing these, an endomorphism of the square in this category box theta n, which comes from going from the square to this composite and then folding up the edges. And so I'm going to call that phi or sidebar. Um, or there I chose the notation to be consistent with the case. Now, what does this look like in pre-sheaves? Well, if we start over here, we have some cube. If we go backwards along this map, we're getting three squares next to each other, where the first and the third one are connections. And then lastly, we compose them, and that gives this square I'll call phi x, which has as its left and right edges degeneracies, as its top and bottom edges composites. And it's not a phi is not, psi rather, is not generally a degenerate square. So this is something kind of new. And what this tells us is that this free cubical n category on the single square is going to look like, yeah, this was a failure of my planning. So it's going to look like this one over here. So we knew that we would have these composites because you have to be able to compose each of these pairs of blue edges. But what this tells us is that we actually get a non-degenerate square that looks like this, in addition to the square we expected, um, whose boundary is the outer morphisms. So, so already we know something kind of weird is going on. The, the free cubicle n category on a square has something extra that we might not have seen coming. And that is not a thing when we don't have the connections. But once we have this, we can go further. So I said the pasting diagrams should be anything that composes into a square. And what this shows is that a, a regular square can compose into a square in two different ways. You can just take the square on the outside, or you could rotate it a little, compose these outer edges, and get something like this. Well, what if we want to compose a bunch of those together? So this is going to give us some new pasting diagrams, because we should be able to stack some of these on top of each other, even next to each other and get pasting diagrams that look kind of like this. All of these squares are filled. Weird. So this is something that when you have connections, these would be extra diagrams that you might want to include in your cubicle theta category because they are perfectly valid diagrams that you can compose into a square. So we'll give a name to that. I'm going to call it um, theta n gamma. Uh, so this is just extending theta n in cubicle n categories to include these. 
again, a full subcategory. So what are some maps that we have here? Well, before then, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but essentially the Siegel conditions extend naturally. You add in a few extra corresponding to these new compositions, but cubical n categories with connections can be just as well. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Are these new objects or new maps? So these are new objects, um, which, you know, come with maps. Um, we're taking the full subcategory, but the maps, um, like this map, for instance, we already had which is part of why it's not going to make a difference whether we define cubicle and categories as Siegel pre-sheaves over um, the original theta n. Or this Do you mind if I follow up? Yeah. Uh, sure. Okay, so um, I was just wondering because sort of one of the things that seemed really attractive about this was that uh, you have a um, tensor product on, the, on that smaller category uh, block theta n, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and do you do you still get that back in uh, in this extended category in a natural way or no? That's a good question, and I'm not sure. I would have to think about it. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that's something to think about. But I, I think that would be really cool if you if you were still able to have a tensor product because yeah, I mean, it would go ahead. Go um, ahead. So I basically started like. You know, I saw this paper, thought it would be fun to present on, and sort of worked out a little bit of how it might look in terms of thetas. So I'm hoping to work on this stuff more um, and get more of it written down beyond these notes. And that would actually be a really good thing to include, I think. Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, I, I suspect if it does exist, it would be weirder and harder to define at the very least. But this is this category, at least in this context, is very much we're, we're using it to facilitate a proof of the equivalence with Gaussian categories. So I'll quickly mention that we could just as well define cubicle n categories as Siegel pre-sheaves over this new one. There's a few extra Siegel conditions. They're not anything we wouldn't have expected from the old ones. Now. Like I mentioned, one of the reasons we want to use this category is because we get things which look a lot more globular in it. And we actually get a functor now from the globular theta n into the cubular, cubicle theta n when we add in these extra objects where it works just as you ex would expect. Send each pacing diagram of globs to the corresponding pacing diagram of these sort of scrunched diagonal cubes. But this functor isn't going to be nice enough uh, to make the comparison, in part because it's far from full. Uh, as you can see, the image of theta n is only going to have the two generating maps um, from the one simplex to the two simplex, um, the ones that pick out these orange ones. But in cubicle theta n, we also have all of these maps to cubicle boundary edges. And while you may be able to get somewhere with this functor, that's not the approach that the paper takes um, in different words. They make a bigger category. Or rather, they do things which made me think the way to model it is to make a bigger category. So these are, we can model the globular pacing diagrams as cubicle n categories, specifically the ones that look like this. And then we can just extend um, our cubicle theta n to include these as well. And I'm gonna write that as theta both square and circular to indicate that it has both the cubicle and the globular pacing diagrams in it. So one of the reasons we want to do this is because this map we saw before from the square to itself in cubicle theta n is idempotent 
and now we have an op now now we can split it. Um, we have an object um, that behaves like its image, and this gives us some nice maps where you can project from the square down to this globular cubicle end category um, that just sends these vertical edges to the identities. And then you can include back into this where the cube that fills this is sent to the cube we discussed earlier that fills in these orange edges. And that looks like this. And this is gonna be very helpful in the comparison. Something else we'll want to note is that we have these maps from the cubicle pacing diagrams down to the globular ones, even when you have different numbers of n cells in each column, that this essentially comes from the cubicle pasting diagrams because we can just project down the ones we don't want. And these include into the old version of globular pasting diagrams, except this one is gonna work a lot better as we'll see in a second. So now let's start comparing things. And the way we're gonna do this is that this category, I don't even know what to call it. Um, this middle category has full subcategories that look like both cubicle theta n um, with or without um, the extra objects we got from connections and from globular theta n. Um, it becomes fully faithful when we use these instead of these. So I'm gonna call these functors alpha and beta. And in a few minutes I have left, start telling you how you can use these functors to compare the subcategories of n categories and cubicle n categories on both of these sides. So first of all, before imposing any Siegel conditions, these give us two adjunctions. Um, now you could have some more adjunctions on top as well, but I'm not gonna mention those just yet. So these give us forgetful functors from pre-sheaves over, call it circle square theta for now, into either of these that just forget everything else. So we have these fully faithful functors, and so you can restrict to the cubicle pasting diagrams or to the globular pasting diagrams. And that will give these forgetful functors. And furthermore, we can immediately see that, first of all, so how do we define these right adjoints? Recall that the general way of doing this is that if we have an object in the circle square version, which I'll call P, then we define the right adjoint of alpha upper star forgetful functor as having as its P component maps in theta N sets from alpha upper star of the representable at P into A. And I'll draw some pictures for this in a minute. And the same goes for beta lower star. And what we're gonna do with this, we also have because alpha and beta are fully faithful, that if we apply the forgetful functor to a representable in the image of alpha or beta, that we just get back the corresponding representable in cubicle or globular theta n. So what this means is that what looks like the representable two cell over here also looks like the representable two cell, even though we modeled it as a cubicle end category over here. And likewise for squares in 
cubicle version. There you go. Just squares in there. And what this means is that we, when we write out the co-unit of this adjunction, without assuming anything on a theta n set A or a cubicle theta n set X, because of these isomorphisms, we get that the co-unit in theta n hat and cubicle theta n hat is an isomorphism. So the cubicle theta n sets and globular theta n sets are both reflective subcategories of Precies over this hybrid category. Now, what remains to be shown? So we know that both of these embed fully faithfully into this middle one. What we want to show is that if we restrict to cubicle n categories over here, so things that satisfy the cubicle Siegel condition, n categories over here, satisfying the globular Siegel condition, that we get the same thing in the middle. So what I'll do is tell you what that looks like and say a few words about why it's true. So I'm going to define a subcategory of Just in case we should be wrapping up in a couple of minutes. Okay, yeah. that should work out. It's, uh, yep. I'll summarize the idea here then, which is we can define a subcategory of this middle pre-sheaf category of pre sheaf Z, which are whose cubicle theta part and whose globular theta part are both Siegel in the respective senses. And we're gonna show that either, either of these conditions is sufficient to prove the other. And that's gonna give the result. So the way we do that is what well, we showed the co-units of these adjunctions are isomorphisms on this end and this end. Now we want to show that the unit is an isomorphism in both cases in the middle. So I'll try to do this very quickly. Um, so this is what the unit looks like. Um, where what it basically amounts to is alpha star, the mapping, the action of alpha star on the Han set of from representables into Z to alpha star of the representable into alpha star of Z. And we can rephrase that because we know that we have a left adjoint using alpha shriek, I think shriek is what it's usually called. So, the proof reduces to showing that Z, which is Siegel in this middle category, has unique liftings against this map, um, which is a co-unit for this top adjunction. But I'll just draw the picture. So we don't have to worry about it when P is a globular pasting diagram because then these automatically agree. What is important is seeing what happens when P is the cube, because in that case, the, if you take the representable cube in the middle category and you pull it back along alpha, we get the globular category that looks like this. So you have a single two cell between composites of the boundary of a cube. And we need to show that when we go back into the hybrid sets, that we have these liftings, that you can always extend one of these diagrams in the circle square version in Z to the entire thing. And in brief, what that amounts to is we know we have this diagonal cube I mentioned before. We need to extend it to the entire cube. 
And if you have globular composites, then or rather if we have the composites that we assume the Z does, the cubicle composites, then you can recover it using this as a composition of this X that we started with, with degenerate and connection squares. And that recovers the big one. So that shows that the unit is an isomorphism on squares. And that actually works for everything because everything else is a composite of squares and the cubical composites arise from the globular composites um, in the sense that you can write down a globular diagram that imitates them. So the globular Siegel conditions in the middle sets imply the cubical ones. So that gives us that one of the units is an isomorphism. And since I'm running out of time, I will just quickly mention that in the remaining case where we need to show that the Siegel pre-sheaves in the hybrid case agree with cubicle end categories. The gist of it is that you can show that for the, so you know it for the cubicle pacing diagrams. Now we need to extend it to the globular ones. You can do this for the two cell and in a similar fashion for the N cell, which is described in the paper. Because this is splitting an item potent, we actually get that the component on the globular pasting diagram is determined by the component on the cube. And then again, because globular composites arise from cubical ones, we can extend that to all the rest of the globular pacing diagrams. So this gives us second equivalence. And in conclusion, shows that by passing through Siegel pre-sheets in this middle category, we get an equivalence between cubical n categories and globular n categories when both connections are present. So I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much. So we're going to do sign of the past as usual. So please join me in thanking Brendan for uh, the talk. And um, yeah, uh, we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. So feel free to unmute your microphone and ask a question. Uh, you can also type your question in the chat and I'll, yeah. I'll give reading it my best attempt. Maybe as we're waiting, I'm just going to say that the end of proof symbol in this particular area uh, will be very confusing. <laughs> uh, it, it just seemed too fitting to skip in the end. So uh, I, I guess I, I, have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, so this is actually really cool that, that it actually works if you restrict to um, this, uh, I guess, blocky theta n without the, without the sort of uh, gamma that you put up top, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. that, that you still have an equivalence of Siegel objects because that category, if I'm, if I'm not like uh, just completely wrong here, it looks like it's, it's monoidal, right? Is that true? So you mean... Um, just what you the, called blocky theta n. Yeah, the original one. So the original. this one. Yeah. Uh, you think that is a monoidal cat? Yeah, I would. I would it hope it so. seems like it, right? So, so the reason why that's interesting somehow is because, um, so in, in the ordinary theta, right? You just don't have. Uh, you have a really nice notion of suspension, sort of, right? But you yeah. don't have a good notion of tensor product, yeah. right? And so if you could do this sort of also at the level of infinity n category, sort of the same style of argument where you sort of embed both in this middle category and try to get cool and equivalences going like a zigzag, right? Then, mm -hmm. then uh, this would actually give you sort of um, infinity n or infinity infinity tensor product. So that's sort of why I, I wrote in the chat, like when, when, you, when you said that, like uh, this is actually kind of an exciting idea, right? Like, because, mm -hmm. you know, Yuki has a, like a 60, uh, some odd page paper proving this in the case n equals two. So I mean, if this could work, 
And that would actually get you a lot somehow. That would be really, really cool. Oh. Neat. Yeah. yeah so that, I, I don't know how I don't know how it would work. It's probably a lot of work, but uh, it's uh, definitely definitely a cool idea. I should mention that um, at the end of the Alago Brown and Steiner paper, after they've proven this, they do say something similar to that. That there is that they extend a. I believe they do extend a tensor product on cubicle um, omega categories. To, they, they, they do, yeah. That's right. Um, I, I haven't looked at that too carefully. But yeah, so I guess in this case, if we're modeling it by theta and we could you know, use this to define. Are the Siegel conditions hard to, to handle somehow? Um, like the intermediate Siegel conditions somehow, are they annoying? Are they difficult to write down in, in general? Um, I mean, I could write them down in general pretty easily um, because they arise from the category of elements of the, um, the representing pasting diagrams. Hmm. But I don't know how nice they are. Uh, I mean, in the, in the combined case, then some of them are globular, some of them are cubical. I assume you mean the, the middle ones with the uh, yeah, yeah. Of, diagrams. Mm -hmm. They're probably not quite as nice. Um, I haven't looked at it in detail, but essentially it would look like the category of elements of a cubicle set that looked like this, um, mm -hmm. mapping in sort of a predictable way into. Yeah, that. I guess, do you mind if, uh, if, if we follow up by email or something? Yeah, yeah, sure. Love to. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. That's a really cool idea. Oh, yeah. yeah, so unfortunately I missed uh, talks last week, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, for the upper and lower connections, do we have any particular requirements on their, uh, how they interact, or are we fairly agnostic? We, it looked like we were applying an upper connection quite far away from an, a lower connection. So distributivity somehow never got used. Is that correct? Um, that's a good question. I don't let think... Me say, yeah, yeah, let me say why. Uh, because I'm um, thinking all along about, you know, imitating Sullivan's rational homotopy theory, where he associates to a simplex the differential forms on it. So I would prefer that the connections be given on, on a cube by uh, a polynomial equation, not by a piecewise linear equation. So I prefer, uh, this is actually already discussed in Boardman and Vogt. Um, they have in their construction of capital W, they say you could use either min or xy. And likewise, of course, you could use either max or X plus Y minus X Y. Now I much prefer the the, quad, the the polynomial version because that allows you then to use polynomial coefficient differential forms uh, as a well polynomial coefficient differential forms on the n simplex form a um, uh, a cubical object with connections. Uh, but it doesn't satisfy distributivity. That was the reason I was asking. The question. Does this yeah, ring well, a bell with anyone? Is this all well known and I just missed the, uh, the moment in the talk? I don't, I don't think, it, I don't know. I mean, you ran into the answer, but I was going to say that uh, at the end of last talk, we made the suggestion of using ANs exactly as a uh, cubical uh, object. And then the question right. was, how do you get connections? And I think you just answered. The yeah, I did. Yeah, about, I apologize. I wasn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, we. I had. I had uh, duties at Northwestern last last uh, Wednesday. I apologize. I, but I have watched the talks. Uh, so, thank you, Brandon. I enjoyed them. Um, yeah, <laughs> other Brandon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this Wednesday. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean the previous Wednesday too. But. Uh, but uh, that was the Wednesday that the question was asked. Is that correct? Yeah. So, yeah, two days ago, uh, there, okay. there was the question. Yeah. Of... Okay, I'll try to hand scribble something explaining that 
carefully and put it on the Slack. Okay. You should also it's revisit the trivial. suggestion of Reed, uh, I think. Of what? Um, uh, Reed had the suggestion of using AMs, and I think, you, yeah, maybe Oh, okay. Th yeah. There, there's some uh, convergence of ideas here. So yeah. it would be interesting to yeah. see. If, well, yes, uh, exactly. If you use piecewise polynomial differential forms for the usual uh, decomposition, then you can uh, use soup and inf as your connection. But if you want to use just polynomial coefficient differential forms over the whole thing, you're restricted to uh, polynomial formulas for, for the connections. That's Notice, by the way, and this is something I realized during this talk, that the, the upper one is x plus y minus xy, and that's quadratic, which looks really bad if you want to restrict attention to Whitney forms. Um, it's linear in each of the two variables. So it uh, actually descends to, it explicitly descends there's an embedding of the regular cubical cochains into the polynomial coefficient differential forms compatible with the connections. So I just, yeah, okay. Anyway, I'm talking too much, but, uh, but so you didn't assume, you don't need to ever do a connection, upper connection right on top of a lower connection, it seems. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, so if I, went back into the equations in the paper, I mm. could give a more mm. well-researched mm. answer. But mm. as far as I know, I don't mm. think that comes up much. I mean, well, you definitely a, need to... Yeah. You use exactly what they use, I hope, uh, because I just yeah. had a very quick look at their paper. And indeed, they, you know, they only look at an upper and a lower connection if they commute, because they're at least separated. Uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, and all, all of the all of the equations that I put in here mm. came from them. I added the, right. yeah. the theta gloss and yeah. a little bit of creative license, but yeah, it's the... just because I saw after I I heard your talk, I started, I saw mention in some of the articles of De Morgan algebras, and then I got a bit anxious <laughs> because these functions don't satisfy De Morgan's laws. Well, this reminds me of something mentioned in the um, book holds Morehouse paper. Hopefully, I said mm. those names right. That's um, that's it exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so where I, so I think they say that Kleene algebras are ah, the, the right okay. one, and De Morgan algebras okay. are a variation that adds something extra. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that works with sup and min, but it it it's too strong for my polynomial version. Okay, good. Thanks. Cool. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we thank Brandon again uh, for his talk.